How can retailers harness the power of the digital transformation to redefine customer acquisition, retention, and customer experience here in 2024? Well, with the global expenditure on digital initiatives projected to reach 3.4 trillion by 2026, the pressure is on for businesses to adapt swiftly and effectively. And today, I'm going to sit down with Rachel Valentine, a forward thinker in the realm of digital innovation at Vincit, to delve into the trends shaping the retail industry. And Rachel brings a wealth of knowledge of how personalised experiences, driven by analytics and AI, are becoming the cornerstone of customer engagement. From the integration of omni-channel approaches to the deployment of progressive web apps, I want to explore the strategies that are setting businesses apart in a crowded marketplace. And this conversation it also promises to be a deep dive in how technology is not just changing the game, but how it's setting new standards for customer interaction, satisfaction and loyalty. So I invite you to join me as I unravel the future of retail in a digital age and also discover how empowering employees and fostering a culture of innovation can actually lead to unprecedented growth and customer happiness. Win-win all round, right? But before we get today's guest on, I need to pay the bills. We've got a huge podcast hosting fee to pay for when we're releasing 30 episodes a month. And this month, I've partnered with a company called KiteWorks. Now, legacy MFT tools are dated and lack the security that today's remote workforce demands. So companies that continue relying on outdated technology, though, they put their sensitive data at risk. Well, enter KiteWorks, the beacon of security and efficiency in managed file transfer, with its FedRAMP moderate authorization awarded by the Department of Defense since 2017. KiteWorks sets a new standard for security. And this certification is not just a badge, it's a promise of unparalleled protection for your data so please step into the future of managed file transfer with kiteworks you can find out more information at kiteworks.com to get started that's kiteworks.com to get you started today so buckle up and hold on tight as i beam your ears all the way to california where rachel's going to join us today so a massive warm welcome to the show can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do Yes. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for having me, Neil. I am Rachel Valentine. I am a general manager for Vincent USA. And Vincent is a leading international software development and design company. Currently here in the U.S., we operate out of Orange County, California in Scottsdale, Arizona. But we are a company that was founded in Finland. So we have global operations in Finland, Sweden, Poland, Portugal, and of course, the U.S. And really what we specialize in is digital and commercial transformations and the execution of custom software and design implementations for clients of ours. So we're never building our own products and software. We're always supporting um, clients of ours to help them turn their business problems uh, around with technology solutions. And so my specific role as general manager is to oversee our general operations here in the U.S., as well as oversee and support the HR people operations. And I've got to ask, with offices in some beautiful parts of the world, with Sweden and Finland, there, do you ever get a chance to, to go over for any events or uh, team building or anything? Have you been to those offices? Yes, I've been fortunate enough to visit the Finnish office or our Finnish offices. We have a couple within Finland, um, Helsinki, Tampere, and Turku. Um, been over there uh, typically about once a year, albeit the last time I was there was for our 2022 Christmas party. So I'm I'm due for a trip soon and hopefully in that uh, next visit can tack on, you know, Sweden, Poland, or Portugal as well. Sounds like a plan, right? So much I wanted to talk with you about today, especially around digital transformation investment. I was reading uh, initiatives projected to reach staggering numbers by 2026. Uh, You might have some of these numbers to hand, but I'm curious, how do you see this year being seen as a a pivotal year for retailers, especially in terms of acquisition and retention? Because huge talking point right now, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think 2024... um, 
retailers face that critical juncture in navigating our evolving landscape with technology, specifically around how they face customer acquisition and and retention amongst the rapid growth of digital transformation initiatives. So we're seeing global spending rise and businesses need to be smart in how they're leveraging that momentum to you know, redefine, redefine what their strategies are for engaging and retaining. So, you know, some key aspects that I think are shaping this year are, you know, emphasis on personalized experiences as consumers are becoming increasingly accustomed to tailored interactions, especially across different digital platforms. Retailers must be smart in how they're prioritizing as well as leveraging data-driven insights to deliver that relevant and meaningful experience to uh, their current base as well as prospective users. So looking at analytics, um, leveraging artificial intelligence, I think retailers can better anticipate then customer preferences, look at optimizing product recommendations, streamlining the purchasing process because, you know, users want things quick. And if there's a hassle or issue, they they leave. Um, so all of these uh, aspects to, to consider, I think, help to foster stronger connections and, and boost those retention rates. And, you know, even thinking about it and kind of taking one step further, especially in the realm of retail, thinking, you know, the convergence of online and offline channels kind of blurs the boundaries of traditional retail. So this year, as retailers look to embrace an omni-channel approach, you know, kind of how can they best integrate physical stores with those e-commerce platforms and mobile apps and having that interconnected ecosystem that, you know, only helps to enhance that shopping experience. And speaking of experiences there, one of the things that's getting more and more apparent is we're living in this world of quick, very quick, straight to the point, 30 second videos. Everyone just expects everything to work, no matter what it is. And if it doesn't, hey, you just jump on to the next big thing. There's always something vying for our attention and distracting us. So considering the low attention spans of consumers now, combined with that demand for error-free experiences, how crucial is process-driven technology in streamlining e-commerce operations from everything from browsing to shipping? Anything you're seeing here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's crucial across all industries, right? Because as we're saying, the attention spans are much more limited. And if, if the interactions aren't seamless, then the customers disappear and might not even ever return. So making sure that um, companies are leveraging technologies to ensure that seamless transaction, like order processing and accurate deliveries, really helps to enhance the customer satisfaction. But, you know, beyond that, it's also imperative for our business's operational efficiency, you know, to help reduce errors and enable businesses to a- adapt more quickly to changing demands in their e-commerce landscape. So I think by embracing, you know, process-driven technologies, e-commerce businesses can stay much more competitive in this evolving marketplace and meet the growing expectations of today's customers. So for us as a company, you know, being an agency where we do help develop software and systems designed to automate and optimize processes, this is really where we will kind of strategically look at the interactions that our clients are having or their users are having from kind of front end to back end operations. So, you know, things to be thinking about, you know, from the customer journey and browsing products to that post purchase support, you could be talking about how your inventory is managed, how that order processing is happening, you know, automated tools to streamline that processing workflow where it captures orders um, with pre-existing information or verifying that payment information and updating order statuses in real time. All of these elements help to, you know, support 
keeping that customer happy and and recognizing that they want things happening and happening fast. And extension of that too is personalized recommendations, right? Where um, algorithms can also help to analyze customer data or purchasing behaviors to provide more um, specific product recommendations to make that purchase faster because that attention span is limited. (laughs) It really is. And I think consumers are so tech savvy now. There's a a significant number of consumers that just abandon their carts if they have a poor mobile experience. There are others that will put things in their uh, shopping cart and leave it in there purposely for a day or a week or so to see if they're emailed a follow-up. You've left things in your um your cart here's a discount code so people are so so uh, savvy around that stuff now so uh, how should companies prioritize progressive web apps in 2024 to ultimately enhance that user experience across different devices because ultimately this that that has become the standard expectation now hasn't it yeah definitely i think you know companies should be if they haven't already um they should be considering progressive web apps because they do offer a compelling a solution that combines the best of both worlds, right? The best features of web as well as mobile applications. They can often deliver fast, reliable, and engaging experiences across various devices and network conditions. So something that you know companies can address with challenges associated to traditional mobile websites where loading times could be slower or there could be limited functionality or performance, um, PWAs or um, progressive web apps really help to leverage more modern technologies to um, be able to kind of work faster and also look at incorporating some of the aspects of what you might see in a native native mobile app where there's that enhanced user engagement. So now PWAs even have features like push notifications or home screen installation just to really re-engage users to drive repeat visits and also help to better deliver timely and relevant notifications. And this can help businesses also keep users much more informed about new products, promotions, updates, and all in all foster stronger relationships that help to increase brand loyalty. So, you know, I think progressive web apps at the end of the day just really represent a valuable opportunity for companies to address challenges that they, that some users might experience with poor mobile experiences and use that to improve user engagement across different devices. So, you know, PWAs are a great thought for future digital strategy as as companies are evaluating their budgets and figuring out what's going to be best for their businesses and users. I think capitalizing on the benefits of fast performance, enhanced user engagement, cross-device compatibility and cost efficiency really are, are things that can help businesses grow and be successful 2024 and beyond. And we've talked today about the importance of keeping customers happy, improving user engagement. But if we were to look under the hood of what makes that possible, of course, it's people, it's internal employees. And the reason I bring that up is that before you came on the podcast today, I was reading how, at Vincent, you strongly emphasize happiness and development for your employees. So can you tell me a bit more about this approach and ultimately how that approach has contributed to the company's growth, customer satisfaction, and employee retention, because we don't talk about this stuff enough. Yeah, yeah. As a company, um, you know, I think Vincent has always discussed that happy employees ultimately lead to happy customers. And it makes sense, right? Naturally, happy employees are probably feeling more supported in their work and are willing or capable to then do better work for clients. And so, We really work to try and foster that type of environment. And some of that comes with allowing for more autonomy and encouraging employees to really speak up and use their voice and and help us to shape the culture and uh, environment that we have. And, you know, just speaking from the experiences we've had in the U.S., 
I mean, when we opened up our operations here, we were able to grow from a team of three employees to over 50 in just shy of four years and go from zero in revenue to over 10 million in revenue with less than 15% turnover just by focusing on happy employees and the culture that we were creating. So, you know, allowing an environment that um, really supports the team has our individuals showing up kind of more engaged, caring more to deliver better products for our clients as well. So yeah, it's been an exciting journey and, and being a part of it because it's great to come to work when the emphasis is, you know, making Mondays better, right? Not having a, a, a dread on Sunday that you've got to go to work. So I've, I've always really appreciated that. Absolutely love that. And Vincent has also uh, been recognized as a, a top workforce for innovators. There's so many companies trying to do innovation right at the moment. So I've got to ask, on behalf of other business leaders listening, what innovative practices, uh, Vincent, do you believe have, have led to that global recognition? Are, are there any stories you can share around that? Yeah, I think where we've been able to stay innovative is also recognizing that we're always an evolving company. So innovative practices that our company demonstrated 10 years ago are, are also different from what what we allow or experiment with our team currently. I think fundamentally, um, we do have a culture that really coaches employees to grow into problem solvers and thinkers versus just individuals that have tasks assigned to them. And I think also instilling an environment that you know, innovation really comes from being passionate about something. So really trying to stay up on the latest in technologies and give our team members access to working with the the latest tech stacks. It's a it's a pro for being um, a part of an agency, right? Being able to work with the latest and greatest. And that I think fuels some of the the passion our team has. And ultimately, enables us to then come up with more creative ideas and creative solutions and have the ability to pitch those to our prospective or current clients. Um, A specific, I think, um, way in which we've really been able to kind of highlight or emphasize this is allowing employees to take ownership of leading themselves and knowing that they have support mechanisms from our HR and people ops team, but, you know, seeing if there's opportunities to change things or open new roles internally, we always, I think, lean into saying yes before no and seeing how things panned out. And as with a lot of companies, that uh, ideology of, you know, fail fast and learn from it. So those kind of aspects of of just the culture that we feel field, I think, is what really pushes us to be a much more innovative workplace. And I'd love to dig a little, little bit deeper on that. So uh, how does empowering employees with the freedom to control their future, as you said there, how does that help contribute to Vincent's overall company growth? Uh, any, any examples of how that empowerment uh, manifests in your daily operations? Again, I appreciate you probably can't share too much, but is there anything you can just to offer any business leader that might be listening that, that takeaway? Yeah, I think, you know, giving autonomy to our employees and the ability for them to provide feedback on their personal direction and growth has allowed us to shape in how we skill up or support them. So versus having this top down belief of you should be focusing on this, really turning it around and looking at it from bottom up. What what direction do our employees want to be leaning into or what areas of innovation do they see um, within the company or areas for improvement? A very specific example related to our USA business is that um, we we really expanded our operations here when an employee in Finland recognized the potential value of our business in the USA market. Um, maybe also wanted to personally live in the U.S., but uh, put together a business plan, presented it to the upper management team, and 
they were willing to run with it and sort of gave a six to 12 month leeway time to sort of see how how it panned out. And now that was, man, eight years ago, the USA operations is very much a large part of our global strategy and how the company and organization wants to grow in future revenue as well as profitability. And this actually was somewhat replicated with how our Portugal office came to be a Business proposal was put forth by more of an individual and small team, and the company allowed for the resources to make that happen. So I think those are very tangible ways in which um, empowering our employees to come up with ideas that they think would better support the future direction of the company and the support to see it through and and to check in and make sure that obviously if it's not going according to plan, then and it might be altered, but we've seen great success from from really leaning into ideas and directions from employees, not just upper management. Absolutely love that. And for any business leader or tech leader listening to our conversation today, they could be anywhere in the world wanting to follow in your footsteps or learn from uh, the journey that you've been on. Is there any advice or lessons that you learned along the way that could help uh, people listening learn from Vincent's approach to employee empowerment and innovation, especially in uh, areas such as software development and in con- particularly in context to the rapidly evolving retail sector as well. And anything that you could share or, or leave everyone listening with there? Yeah, I, I guess I would say that I think it's just always really valuable to remember that no matter what position you might be in, especially one in higher upper management is that there is so much value to be learned from one another, especially if you're approaching much more of a bottom up type leadership versus just top down, listening to employees uh, really at any industry where they're on the front lines and seeing the experiences of what that customer might be you know, experiencing and and uh, picking their brain to better understand what changes could be implemented. So I I always just try to remind myself that no matter what the employee's title is, I'm sure they know something about the business that could further educate me as I stand in more of a management position. And I think that's just true across any industry or any company of any size. So just being willing to ask the questions or facilitate dialogue with all employees and and really be willing to listen. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights with listeners all around the world today. And before I let you go, I'm going to ask you to leave everyone listening with one final gift. And we have a bit of a tradition on the show where I ask my guests to leave a book that has inspired them or that they would recommend to our Amazon wish list or a song that we can add to our Spotify playlist. All I'll ask you is, what would you like to leave everyone listening with and why? Yeah, I I always highly recommend the book by Brene Brown, Dare to Lead. I think it's been very pivotal in my own learnings and accepting kind of feelings of vulnerability and leadership. And I think that really ties into the wanting to have candid dialogue with employees at all levels and to be able to ask questions and and share stories and be able to be vulnerable with one another in knowing that you as an individual are growing or it's contributing to the benefits of the company. Oh, so well, I'll have that. I'll, I'll get that added straight to our Amazon wish list. And for anyone listening wanting to find out more information about anything we talked about here today, find out more information about Vinci, connect with you, your team, where would you like to point everyone listening? Yeah, I highly recommend heading to the Vincent website, www.vincent.com. We have a lot of great material around topics trending in the industry, as well as free guides. So I highly recommend um, checking out the website for more relevant information, or if you're interested in ever having a position at Vincent as well, head over to our LinkedIn page where you can check out job opportunities as well as our input on what's what's trending and what's going on. Fantastic. Well, we've covered so much there. I love chatting with you, especially about such a, a 
trending topic right now, and that is the low attention spans. There's very little room for mistakes, and customers do expect smooth sailing everywhere, and nothing drops customers quite like a poor mobile experience. So the, the role of progressive web apps, and also the role of looking after your people and innovation and empowering people to do that inspiring stuff. But more than anything, just thank you for sharing your insights today, Rachel. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, Neil. I think it's evident that the landscape of retail is undergoing a profound transformation fueled by digital innovation. And the key takeaways from my conversation today is the importance of creating personalised, seamless and error-free experiences that meet the high expectations of modern consumers. And Rachel's insights into the utilisation of everything from analytics and AI and progressive web apps for me, it illuminates a path forward to for retailers aiming to not only survive, but thrive in this digital era. But of course, the journey doesn't end with technology alone. And as Rachel highlighted today, the empowerment of employees, the cultivation of a culture that embraces passion and innovation and problem solving, these are the things that are fundamental to sustainable growth and enhancing customer satisfaction. So for anyone looking for ROI, that is it right there. But it also raises a crucial question for all of us in tech and retail sectors. How will we continue to innovate and adapt our strategies and ensure that we're not just keeping pace with technological change, but we're driving it? So as always, I invite you to share your thoughts, join the conversation as we explore this dynamic interplay between technology, business and the human element in shaping the future of retail. And you can do that by emailing me, techblogwriter at outlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Let's keep this conversation going. But it's time for me to go now. I'll be back bright and early tomorrow morning with another guest. But thank you for listening today. And until next time, don't be a stranger.